All right. Hello, everyone who has logged in so far. Welcome to the first of many Community Science LI webinar series. We're going to start in a little bit, just let people kind of settle in, get comfortable. And yeah. Mike, you should have an otter background. I know. <laughs> I got to give, you know, my brother put that up for me when I, you know, months ago. And of course, I don't know how to change it. <laughs> well, it's right in the, the coyotes right in the middle. So <laughs> it doesn't make sense. <laughs> Still a picture, regardless. Um, so we have somebody raising their hand. Don't know if that was on purpose. Hi, John. Yeah, John Thomas just said something. <laughs> what? Pete Weiss, if you if you uh, you can write in the chat if you got anything. Mike, can you see the chat? Yeah, but I can't see the whole thing. Uh, oh, here we go. Oh, Artie, heard, I guess so everybody can hear me chatting. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Artie. <laughs> I, I'm getting a little preview of what it's going to be like when someone comes up to me and says, Mike, we got to take the keys to the car away from you. <laughs> oh, Sarah Walkley, great. Awesome, we have a good amount of people um, logging in. So maybe we can, we can get started? Yeah, sure. Awesome. So like I said, welcome to the very first webinar in the Community Science LI webinar series. We are so excited to have you all joining us tonight. Now that it's five o'clock, work is over, the real fun can begin. My name is Ariel Santos, and I am joined by my colleagues, Mike Bottini and Jimena Perez Viscasillas today. And the goal of this series is to highlight various community science opportunities around Long Island and how the data accumulated by the public influences local environmental management efforts. So Mike and I are from CTUC Environmental Association, which is a nonprofit 501c3 organization dedicated to conserving Long Island wildlife and the environment. Jimena joins us from the Long Island Sound Study, which is a cooperative effort involving researchers, regulators, user groups, and other concerned organizations and individuals to protect and improve the health of Long Island Sound. Together with support from the Peconic Estuary Partnership and the South Shore Estuary Reserve, we bring you Community Science LI. So just some housekeeping notes to go over. This webinar and all future webinars are going to be recorded. All of the recordings will be available on CTUC's website shortly after the webinar concludes. Your video and microphones are turned off, but you are free to ask questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. And you're also more than welcome to utilize the chat box to add any comments or say hello, of course, but we will be closely monitoring the Q&A section. Um, so we'll be answering questions during the presentation and, of course, after during the dedicated Q&A period. With that, I would like to introduce the panelists today. So we have Mike Bottini, wildlife biologist for SeaTuck Environmental Association. He will discuss river otter ecology, natural history on Long Island. And then we have Jimena Perez Viscasillas, Long Island Sound Study Outreach Coordinator and co-host of Community Science LI. And finally, myself, Ariel Santos, I am the Policy Program Coordinator for SeaTuck Environmental Association, and I will go through the latest draft of our distribution of river otter on Long Island map and unveil the brand new Otter Watch Survey 123 field app, where community scientists like yourself can log sightings of river otters near you. So without further ado, I will go ahead and share my screen and let Mike take it away. Okay, thank you, Ariel, and thank you to um, to everybody out there. And I, I really need to do a shout out to 
all of the people that have made this project possible. I started this uh, Long Island River Router project in 2008. And in my first report issued in 2009, I was able to actually put everybody on the thank you list and fit it all on one page in the report, but that would be impossible to do now um, because there's so many people that have um, helped out. Some, of I, some, some people I've only been in touch with by phone and email, and I've actually never even met. But um, I really appreciate all the help and enthusiasm towards this project over the years. Okay, so um, why are we talking about um, recolonization of Long Island? Like what, what happened? Um, before we start, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of otters um, on Long Island and North America in general. And uh, before we move on to the next slide, though, I'd like to point out this photograph taken by Joe Kelly, um, a really good photographer, lives on Long Island. This is on the Nisiquag River. He actually managed to get this shot while sitting in his kayak. And um, notice the, the two things about this photograph. So um, the otter on the right, its whole head and part of the neck is out of the water. That's called a that's called periscoping, to get a better look at what um, made them jump off the bank and into the water. What scared them? What, what was coming along? So um, I get a lot of photos and videos and queries about sightings of otters that that end up being confused with muskrat. Um, now muskrat, you won't see the whole head come out of the water. So that's a really good way to identify um, river otter and distinguish them from some other semi-aquatic mammals. Um, the other thing to notice is the nose pad. It's very prominent, very wide, very bulbous. And that's another key feature if you get a good look at um, what you think is a river otter. Look for that. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so this uh, on the left is the, uh, the distribution of river otters pre-European settlement. And essentially river otters were found in all waterways throughout North America. And then the, the, on the right side is a, is a map showing the distribution of river otters in 1977. Now at this point, a lot of the um, populations of otters were on the rebound, believe it or not, but you can see these huge gaps where they were extirpated. So 11 states and Prince Edward Island uh, lost all their otters uh, by 1900. And then uh, since the 70s, there have been many reintroduction projects, including one in New York State. Okay, next. So the main cause of extirpations, including uh, in North America, including Long Island, was the fur trade. Otter pelts were like, the, the, they were the gold standard of the fur trade. They were super valuable because of the density and the durability of their fur. We often think of the beaver in terms of the, uh, the fur trade, but essentially it was quite a few fur bearing mammals that were impacted by the, uh, the fur trade era. And this, so there was, it was unregulated hunting and trapping that decimated populations throughout North America. Okay, next. So in New York State, um, believe it or not, the, the only otter populations left in the entire state by 1900 were up in the, uh, was a small remnant population in the Adirondacks. And in 1939 to, to 1948, they put a moratorium on hunting and trapping to let that population recover. So really, Conservation laws didn't come into effect until the early 1900s. Okay, next slide. And it, it, so really we're, we're, we're talking about a century later, the river otter still was not found in the whole Western half of New York State, uh, nor on Long Island. And in 1995, the, uh, the DEC implemented a, uh, with, with the help of a, 
a not-for-profit conservation group implemented a reintroduction project, trapping otters elsewhere in the Northeast and releasing them in areas to fast track their recolonization of the state. And those stars show the locations where the otters were released. Okay, next. And on Long Island, um, we do have some information from old naturalists. We know river otters were part of the uh, fauna here many years ago. And decay in uh, an, a well-known naturalist in 1842 published a little bit about the otter. And he said, um, they used to be common, but uh, it has been extirpated on Long Island and Staten Island. So that was, you know, as of the early 1800s. Now, Paul Connor published this um, small bulletin packed with great information published in 1971. It was based on his field work on Long Island in the 1960s. You can get a PDF file of this on the SeaTuck website, uh, really a good resource. And um, Paul said that, and this is a really good field biologist, he could not find any evidence of otters on Long Island. And he mentions in this manuscript that uh, otters, um, meant there are many otter reports uh, here and there over the years that in, in interviewing naturalists, but he felt that they were transient otters which had, uh, you know, so these are juveniles that are looking for uh, new areas to set up their um, home range. Okay, next. Um, so how do, you, how do you survey for otters? How do you determine if otters are in an area or not? So I, I had some funding in 2008 to look at this issue. We, there was otter, the, we had, a few scattered reports of sightings. We had a few scattered reports of road kills where we actually had the carcass, so we couldn't argue about that. And, but no one knew uh, where otters were located, uh, whether they were transients or residents, and um, where they had established home ranges. So there's, with any, with any wildlife species, if you wanna do surveys, um, you might be able to, to just look for them. And um, so they're where, where they have been sighted, but otters are very nocturnal, especially in a very developed landscape. Um, they have huge home ranges up to, uh, in coastal areas, up to 24 linear miles of shoreline. And they're always moving around in that home range. So you might go out every day and check um, uh, a, a couple sites say around Lake Ronkonkoma and you'll never find the otters. You're never gonna see them. And they could come through uh, maybe once every four to six weeks, just for a couple days. So you just have to chance seeing them at that time. So that's not a very effective way to, uh, to survey for otters. Tracks would, would work okay if we had more snow cover, um, but it's very sketchy here on Long Island. So the way, to, the way that most people do otter surveys throughout North America really is to uh, do what we call a latrine survey. And uh, a latrine is, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit, but basically just as the word you can imagine, it's where they defecate. Um, and what you're looking for is the scat particularly. Um, and the other thing about latrines is that um, the scat sticks around for a while. So you don't have to be there like within a couple of days. You come by up to two or three weeks after uh, they defecated and still see remnants of the scat there. And if the latrine is visited periodically, if you go back say in another couple of months and you find some more scat that wasn't there before, you're more likely to be seeing evidence of a resident otter as opposed to a transient otter. And that's an important distinction to make. Okay. So an otter latrine, it's also known as an otter scent station where you're gonna find um, where, they, where they leave their scat and they leave this jelly-like material. That's what you can see. You can't see the urine um, and you can't see 
the scent that's left on the ground at the latrine site. Um, and I have a photograph there in the upper right, and it shows the hind foot, the bottom of the hind foot. And you see those little round Velcro-like pads on the bare spot of the, the hind foot. Uh, those are connected to scent glands. And I'll show you the behaviors at the at the the, the, lot of the uh, latrines sites, and you can see how they um, pound their feet down on the ground to to leave that scent there. They also do a lot of rolling and scraping behavior, scraping the leaf litter, and um, that makes it easy to spot uh, these uh, auto latrine sites. And I did a camera study over the course of a year at a, a several of the latrine sites on Long Island. And I found that the uh, visits were surprisingly short. They come out of the water, they dry off, they leave their uh, urine, their scat, their jelly-like secretions, and then they take off. And 97% of them were at night. Um, and I, I kind of expected that they would hang around at the latrine um, and take a break from fishing. But uh, as I said, very short, less than a minute most of the time. And what is the function of this? Well, we, we don't really know for sure. Um, so these are hypotheses. Obviously, they can check out the breeding status, the males and the females, and who's ready to mate. Um, it may be a... Um, a way to communicate whether they want company or not. You know, no, keep out, I'm here fishing for a couple of days and you can come in when I'm gone. They could also be communicating what's easiest to catch at this particular time of the year, which may be important in the winter when um, they want to, uh, they really, they have a high metabolic rate and they want to get in and out of the water pretty fast. Um, and uh, limit their hunting time in the water. So another thing to know about otters, they're not territorial. Uh, they have overlapping home ranges. And, um, and, and so to avoid confrontation, we think that these scent stations are communicating information that, uh, that avoids that conflict and fights. And <clears throat> I should also mention on the left, um, one of the things I found with the camera study the otter scent stations are visited by all sorts of other animals, um, mostly raccoons. Every single otter latrine on Long Island might get visited by an otter on a monthly basis, but um, the raccoons are there pretty much every night passing through. Um, so that's something to keep in mind when you're doing the survey. You need to distinguish between raccoon sign and otter sign, which is a little tricky. But also, uh, I think there were like four otter scent stations on Long Island that had uh, Canada geese nesting there. And I'll point out something about the structure of the otter latrine site that makes that attractive for uh, waterfowl to nest there. And by the way, this otter was uh, crossing over from one pond to another and uh, ran into the Canada goose nest, which wasn't there the last time he visited. And the male goose uh, went after the otter and they had this standoff. Now the otter could have dispatched the Canada goose in a couple of minutes, but like, all right, I'll go back the way I came. <laughs> and uh, it was kind of an interesting series of photographs I got. Okay. All right, so this is one of the videos of otter behavior, and uh, you can start that area. So it came out of the water, there's water on the left. I mean, sorry, there's water on the right where it came out of, out of a swamp. And it's gonna dry off and hang out. It took a little snooze behind that tree for a couple seconds and then went back in the water. And this is its scraping behavior. So it's, it's scraping the leaf litter into a pile and those scrape marks really stand out and make it easy to pick out a latrine. Okay, and then this is uh, what I believe is a male and female. This, the date of this is, is in March. The female most likely already gave birth to some pups. And after she gives birth, 
she starts uh, going into estrus and they'll, uh, they'll mate. And I think this is a mating pair, but if you notice the, the hind feet bounced up and down while it was defecating and urinating. So that's part of their little latrine dance and leaving their scent. Okay. All right, next is, you know, where do we look for latrines? Now that we know what somewhat what some of the functions are for otters, uh, if we're gonna use this as a survey tool, we wanna be able to minimize where we're, we're actually looking at in the field. And so this is really helpful because it's a, a, you, can, you can look at a topo map or a, an aerial photograph and pick out the most likely spots to survey for these latrines. So points of land that jut out into the water, um, small islands are very attractive where they have to get out of the water to get around an obstruction such as a dam and the shortest overland route between two waterways. So this photograph, um, my kayak is, is parked on one little freshwater pond and my paddle's pointing to the water in an adjacent pond and it's maybe 50 feet uh, between the two in this narrow band of uh, woodlands. And this is a latrine site. So you can see the huckleberry and low bush blueberry you normally find with the leaves trapped in there in the understory of the forest. And then this dramatically cleared out area right adjacent to the water. Um, so they're, they're easy to pick out when, when you're surveying in the winter months. Um, the best time to check in terms of when they leave their sign, when they're marking, it's, it starts in, it peaks in November and goes through into um, April. So, which is nice because the leaves aren't out and it's very, it's very striking to see this and you, you know something's going on there. They're also within 15 feet of the water. Um, so that's another key for locating where to survey. Okay. Now, also where to survey, well, you know, when the, the name river otter, you might think they're only going to be found in rivers, but they use all sorts of shallow um, wetland habitats. This is the Nisiquag River in the upper left. Uh, this is Plum Pond in the upper right. That's Mishomic Preserve. And that's kind of uh, brackish water there. And then um, they also use the salt marsh. And when I did the the, the latrine survey I started looking carefully at the fish scales in, in the scat and um, I was really surprised to find that um, one of the fish that they go after it's very numerous is uh, the striped killifish and mummy chop which are found um, in the salt marsh areas real shallow areas okay so um, Here's a spot uh, near where I live in East Hampton. And um, this is a perfect, a perfect setup, per perfect physical characteristics for an otter latrine. And I had documented otters at this point um, at Mishomic Preserve, which is just across the, uh, the tidal waters from this spot, um, not far for an otter to swim. And it was some years though before they actually, an otter set this up as part of their home range. So you have a tidal creek and salt marsh and this earthen dam and an impoundment of fresh water. And the, the latrines are all along the earthen dam where they take a shortcut to get out of the freshwater pond and get into the tidal creek. Okay. And here's another site. Um, when I started in the, the survey in 2008, I learned that there was a roadkill um, at the closest intersection to the, the series of ponds and, and cattail marshes. It's all fresh water. And then looking at the aerial photograph and I'm saying, okay, well, there's a crossover here between those two ponds with the red arrow. And that's actually the photograph I took before with my, uh, my kayak and the kayak paddle. And what I, I didn't think the star, that didn't jump out at me because it's kind of not a prominent 
point jutting out into the pond. But when I started paddling around the pond to get to this spot, I realized, well, that this is a high knoll. And I said, that's worth checking out. And lo and behold, that was another good auto latrine site right there. So in an area like this, there's, um, I've documented about 10 to 12 latrine sites um, but all you have to do is find one or two and then monitor them. And then, you know, okay, there's an otter living in here. This is part of their home range. Okay. Mike, just letting yeah. you know, this is the five minutes. Okay. <laughs> all right. So um, this is what you want to look for when you find um, the, uh, a, a potential latrine site. So you're looking for the, the scat. And on Long Island, most of the scat is fish scale or, or crayfish. And the fish scales will slowly degrade. So on the left is very fresh, less than a day old with a greenish, greenish mucus coating the scales. And then it eventually dries out into a charcoal gray and then you're left with these bleached out uh, bones and scales. Okay, next. And this is uh, crayfish remains. They love crab and crayfish. Next. And this is the jelly-like secretion I talked about. This is a little unusual. It's not very common, but um, you'll, you'll notice this uh, if you find it. Okay, next. And then when you're out in the field, you come across some really cool things. Like this is that day bed in the cattail marsh. So they bend down the cattails and they make a nice little dry spot to lay out in the sun during the day. Okay, next. And the results of the 2018 survey, so a decade after I started, showed they were definitely expanding their distribution on Long Island, covering pretty much all of the North Shore of Long Island, the Peconic uh, River watershed, Nissaquag River watershed, and part of the South Fork. But there's still a lot of great habitat left uh, for you folks to help out in terms of documenting their um, increase in distribution on Long Island. Okay, next. And a couple things about uh, otters. I get a lot of um, emails and calls about otter sightings and otter, potential otter tracks. So it's hard to mistake an otter <laughs> when it's on land like this posing for you uh, with that distinctive tail. Uh, but in the water, it's another story. Next. Uh, so here we have a series of uh, semi-aquatic and aquatic mammals. And as I said before, in the, in the uh, lower right is the otter with the big nose pad and it's periscoping. Um, the seals also lift their, you know, most of their head out of the water. There's a gray seal on the lower left. And I have had some Miss IDs um, seal that people thought were otters. And then on the, um, the upper right is uh, muskrat. That's the most common uh, sighting that I get. And they won't, they just stay at the surface like that. They don't lift their head up. And on the, um, the upper left is beaver. We did have a beaver residing in East Hampton for some years, but it's no longer here. Okay. And here's a quick video of um, some otters uh, fishing. So you can see how the behavior is a little different. So they're, they're, Busy hunting, they don't even notice me for a couple minutes uh, floating along in my kayak. And they pop their head out, the whole head comes right out of the water, there's three of them there. And uh, we assume that periscoping is a way for them to get a better view of potential threats. Okay, next slide. And just go over real quickly some track ID. So raccoon, as I mentioned, is the common um, animal that's confused with otter, uh, both the scat and the tracks. And these are otter, I mean, sorry, these are raccoon tracks on the left. And they're the same size range and the same number of toes as the river otter. Next. And here's the river otter. And <clears throat> I want to point out the real thing to look for, the real good distinction is on the hind foot, there's the inner toe. So where, like in our hand, it would be your thumb. 
is set down low compared to the other four toes. And that's where I have a little tick mark pointing to it. So there's three hind feet in here with that low toe on the inside. Uh, that's a big distinction between otter and uh, raccoon. Next. And then, if the, and then the gate is really key. This is the common raccoon gate where you have, um, if, you, if you draw a line along the back or the front of each set of two tracks, you, it creates a diagonal and the diagonal goes down to the left and then it goes down to the right and then it goes down to the left and it goes down to the right, a pattern like that. And that's the raccoon gate, not the otter gate. Okay. And of course, otters like to slide even on the flat snow covered ice. Next. So what? So what? <laughs> Why study otters? Um, unlike a lot of the, the wildlife that are top of the food chain around here, like the osprey that are, have a strictly aquatic diet, uh, otters are not migratory and they're a good species to look at and see, okay, what's the health of our system? Uh, so that's one reason. And also, uh, next slide, they're, they're, they're a very charismatic, this is, a, this is an animal that you can get people excited about. It's in the neighborhood. This is a uh, Riverhead area. We had a roadkill at that red pin uh, a couple years ago. And it, the, the, whoops, the, the otters uh, coming out of the Peconic River following a tributary. And it's amazing that they even knew there were freshwater ponds on the other side of Route 58. This is a car dealership in Mall City. And uh, I found six latrines on those little ponds by Osborne Avenue. So a number of people from Riverhead, including their environmental subcommittee, asked me to uh, to look into, you know, how can we how can we better protect the riparian zone um, in some of uh, the tributaries that are that are that make their way up into Riverhead Town? Because they're redoing their master plan. So, uh, you know, I think people can get excited about doing a better job of conserving these natural resources. Next, and uh, that's it. I'm looking forward to uh, post COVID when I can get out in the field with everybody. Um, I love doing workshops on wildlife track and sign in general, and particularly uh, looking for otter signs. So uh, hope to see you in the field and stay safe. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Okay, so I'm gonna turn this over to Ariel now to go over the, uh, the map portion of this. Yes. So I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Can you all see that okay? Yep. Okay, awesome. So like Mike said, I'm gonna go over the map that we have put together so far. Um, the main goal of this map is to illustrate the current known distribution of otters on Long Island. This map is currently a work in progress, but we thought it would be useful information to share with you all. So Mike and I are gonna tag team explaining various layers of the map and to start, I thought I'd go through some of the more straightforward data that is illustrated here. So as you can see, there's various points on this map here. Um, and on the left, we have a legend here that shows which points represent what kind of information. So for example, we have the yellow circle, which represents documented otter latrine sites. We have this little camera icon that represents otter photos and videos. This red X that represents roadkill and carcass information, orange circles for potential otter latrine sites. And then we have these various shades of blue polygons that represent um, otter presence in surface waters around Long Island. So I'm going to just zoom in on one point of the map. I know there's a bit of a lag, so forgive me if it makes you dizzy. <laughs> I'll try my best to make it smooth. Okay, so this is a good spot to show kind of some of the information that I just went over. So if you click this yellow dot, that represents a documented otter latrine site. 
So this pop-up will describe the site. So right here it says Macama Preserve. It's in the Crab Meadow watershed. It provides the coordinates, the date, um, and the otter sign. So there was two sets of scat found here and a scrape. And something just to note, um, when there's data points kind of nearby each other, out of um, just ease, ArcGIS will kind of group them together in one pop-up. So if you see one of three, it's just saying that there's some features nearby. If you don't want to click on those separately, you can go over and see, you know, Crab Meadow Creek here and so on and so forth. Then we have the camera icons around here. So this icon has a video attached to it. So any videos in the pop-ups will show up as links. Um, and again, it has location information, the year. And if we click this link here, we have this awesome video pop-up. And just to save some time, I'm not gonna run through the whole thing. So maybe we can just skip through here. Awesome. And then we also have photo icons. So photo pop-ups, for example, that the images will actually show up within the pop-up. So if we click this camera here, we can see this image right there. And if you wanna blow it up to get a better kind of idea of it, then you have that right there. And then last for me, we have the red X for roadkill and carcass information. And this is also, again, pretty straightforward. The date it was discovered, the town, and some details about the carcass. So Mike, I thought I would hand it over to you if you wanna describe kind of what we mean by potential otter latrine sites um, and otter presence within established home ranges, assumed occupancies um, and unoccupied areas. Okay, thanks Ariel. Um, so we're gonna go over to the Carmen's River and zoom in onto one of the potential otter latrine sites. So. We, we want to work on this to help citizen science volunteers to, uh, to focus their survey in their, their neck of the woods, a place they visit a lot, a place nearby, um, <clears throat> by, by, by you know, identifying those physical characteristics of otter latrine sites and then uh, where to you know, focus your efforts. So this is, if some, any of you are familiar with uh, the Carmen's River. This is where Weeks Pond has a little spillway over into the river. And that's a great little shortcut. Otters cruising down the Carmen's River, they're going to want to hop over into Weeks Pond and maybe catch some frogs. And uh, they, they do love bullfrog tadpoles um, that are most likely in there. So we want to get um, you know, ideally two or three sites in each uh, watershed on the South Shore, evenly spaced, maybe maybe every uh, eight to 10 miles. Uh, we do have our first um, established home range on the South Shore of Long Island as of 2019. Uh, there's now a pair of otters in Connecticut River State Park. So that's kind of exciting. Um, the yellow dot on the Forge River over to the east is actually not, that was not a maintained latrine. We'll have to take that out. That's a, a one shot only <laughs> latrine I found in 2008. It was never revisited. Okay, so then knowing that uh, we're gonna go up into the Stony Brook area. So check this out. So we have the Nissaquag River there um, in, in, a, in a darker, a little bit darker shade of blue. We have many latrines documented on the Nissaquag River and actually uh, many photographs as well. We have two road kills in the general area. 
but we don't have any documented latrine sites in that West Creek um, watershed that's right by where it says Stony Brook. Uh, it's a lighter blue. And, you know, I want to be careful when um, I, I assume that otters are in there because we have had an otter living a little bit further east up in Frank Melville Pond Park. I guess it's called the Mill Pond uh, by, the, by the East Setauket uh, Post Office. Um, that's been there for a couple of years now. And given this, the home range size of, of 12 to 24 linear miles of shoreline in any otter's home range, uh, surely they're moving around in there. Uh, but we wanted to distinguish assumed occupancy from the established home ranges. Because again, we'd be great if someone can actually document that. Um, you know, really give that a good look around. Probably easiest to check out the West Creek area by um, kayak or canoe. And also, if you zoom back in there, the other thing I wanted to point out was the roadkill. So this, these roadkills are quite recent. And another thing that we don't know about river otters is you know, would they, in order for them to get from the Nisiquab to Stony Brook Harbor, would they go out into Long Island Sound and swim along the shoreline and then duck in? One would think that would be a logical way to do it. They're great swimmers. But I think their habits are, they tend to want to connect watershed to watershed by an overland route uh, where possible. And it appears there's actually at least one little pond in between Stony Brook Harbor and the Nisiquag River. Um, so um, that's kind of a, that's another thing about it. They, they, we think of otters as being in the water, but they actually spend 75% of their time on land, um, mostly in the riparian area close to their hunting spots, but they do travel overland. So. So that, that's sort of uh, the deal with that. And we're looking forward to uh, uh, being able to um, show the increased distribution of otters along that South Shore area. As I said, lots of great habitat. It dovetails with a lot of the work Sea Tuck is doing with restoring um, river herring runs and uh, and also out on the South Fork, there's a, there's a lot of potential habitat that otters haven't occupied yet. So as we found with the recolonization, the natural recolonization of New York, it's a slow process, but it's definitely um, happening on Long Island. And, um, and there's, there's a lot of those red X's which are slowing things down too, but we, Another project is to, to look at some of the roadkill situations and see you know, if we can mitigate that by providing a safer way for them to get across roadways. Yeah, that was great. Thank you, Mike. And just to you know, bring it back to the bigger picture, you know, we hope that this will be a useful tool for community scientists to be able to see the distribution of river otters on Long Island and two, to use it to help us fill in the data gaps, you know, and look for spots near them and these orange dots that they can go out and survey for river otters near them using the Otter Watch survey. So at this point, I'm going to go over the Otter Watch survey. If you can see that here, okay. It's a little bit small, Ariel. Is there a way to zoom? There isn't. This is my, is that any better? A little bit, maybe try control plus. Hmm, it's not working. Are you able to see kind of the question? Yeah, yeah I think so. Okay. By the way, five more minutes. <laughs> okay, so, um, Survey123 is hosted by ArcGIS Online, which is the same platform that is used to create that distribution map. 
So with Survey123, you can create surveys online that the public can use to submit all sorts of information. Um, so to access this OtterWatch survey, the link will be provided online at CTUC's website at www.ctuc.org. Um, you can choose to view the survey in your web browser or download the free mobile application on your phone. But first, I will go through the web browser. So as you can see, we have OtterWatch here. Um, the purpose of the survey being to assist scientists in accumulating data showing the range of river otters on Long Island. So it's pretty straightforward at first, you know, date and time, your location, something just to note quickly that if you're out surveying during the day, um, but your phone dies or you need to connect to Wi-Fi and you wind up submitting your survey at home, just keep in mind that we want the location of the actual observation that you had seen earlier in the day and what time that was. Um, number, otters, number of otters observed, and then we go down into a little bit of more detail here. So observation descriptions. We ask you to choose all that apply for each individual otter observed. So that goes from otter one all the way to otter five. And you'll see here, we ask things like, is it in the water swimming at the surface? Is it in the water swimming and diving? And at first these questions might seem arbitrary, but the details in these questions actually help with confirming identification, especially if someone doesn't submit a photo into the survey or if, this, if the photo is hard to interpret. Um, for example, a muskrat usually stays at the surface or an otter typically goes up and down going after fish. So all of these you know, entries really help us narrow down whether or not you've seen an otter or something like a muskrat. And of course, if you've seen more than five otters, we simply just ask you to type in otter six, periscoping, otter seven, feeding on land, you know, kind of just a simple entry like that. Then there's spots to insert images. You can select a file from your computer or your phone or take the photo live. And then we have evidence of otter signs. So that tracks, scat, scrape, that Mike had touched on. We ask you to enter in the number of scats or the number of tracks and then the distance to the water. So distance to water is telling because we would be looking for evidence of otter activity within 15 feet from the water's edge. So basically 15 feet would be the furthest that an otter latrine would be from the water. Um, if there's evidence any further than that, we would probably presume it to be maybe a raccoon latrine, but this is something that we would confirm in the field. So we're not expecting people to be running around with a tape measure or anything. Um, so don't worry about that. Um, and then once we go back down here, again, pretty straightforward questions, name, email, phone number, and submit. So that's the web browser version. Uh, and then I'll quickly just go through what it looks like on the mobile app. I'm going to stop sharing here. Switch over to my phone. Can you all see my phone okay? Yep. Awesome. So that's my own pet otter, my dog Rusko there. So we go to survey one, two, three. So what's cool is that you don't need to have a ArcGIS account. You can just continue without signing in at the bottom there. And now what's also really cool about the Survey123 mobile app, it's free, and you also can have all of your community science projects in one spot. Um, so as you can see here, I have OtterWatch. I'll go ahead and click that, collect information, and voila. All of the information and all the questions are exactly the same. They operate exactly the same. And then when you're all done, you would hit that bottom right hand check mark. Or if you want to save it for later, when you connect to Wi Fi, you can hit the top X, save in drafts. And now you have that, that survey saved for you for next time. And you could see that in the top right corner of the Otter Watch thumbnail, it says basically you have a little orange circle there. You have a draft. Don't forget to submit me. Um, so that's pretty much it for the Survey123 app. I know I went through that a little quickly, 
but if you have any questions in the future about the survey one two three app or if you have any issues all of my information will be provided at the end so if mike you don't have anything else to add maybe we can hop right into the q a period perfect yeah we're right on time so we have a bunch of questions um so um and mike if you click on the bottom uh, there's a Q&A button, and you should be able to see some of the questions that have been uh, coming in and comments for you. A lot of people are interested in what that jelly-like secretion is. We, um, well, it's a, it's a secretion from an anal gland. Uh, we don't know what the purpose of that is. Um, uh, there's, the more you get into studying any particular animal, I also study spotted turtles, and, you know, you just... Uh, there's a lot we don't know, believe it or not. So um, yeah, no idea. And it's so intermittent that it's hard to believe it's a, it's some kind of a symbol. This is no real pattern to it. Um, the whole, the whole field of scenting is, is, is really fascinating. And there's, there's still a lot we can learn about wildlife in terms of that. And Is someday no... we may be able to decode the scent the way we've decoded, we, the way we've done fingerprinting with DNA. Uh, but that's not available right now, to my knowledge. Is it known why the jelly secretion is found in latrines? Somebody was asking. Uh, so th that, that's part, it's, a, it's obviously some kind of a scenting thing but we don't understand the function of the scent. Okay. Um, do you have any knowledge of whether otter residency here on Long Island is seasonal or whether we have otters year round? Definitely year round, yeah. They're non-migratory, I mentioned that. They, they have established home ranges and they really have to get to know their home range really well in order to get through the, the cold winter months. Uh, they have very short fur. If they had long fur and blubber, they wouldn't be able to get around as well in the water with the long fur. They wouldn't be able to get a, a long, around as well on land. And I said they, they spend 75% of their time on land. So they're, they're, they're designed, so to speak, as a trade-off. Um, so they, when they get in the water and, there's, and, and it's an ice-covered pond in the middle of winter with a couple inches of snow on there. That it's a tricky situation. You know, you, you can't spend a lot of time uh, swimming around under the ice trying to find something to eat. Um, so they really have to know what's there and where the fish are likely to be congregating. And one theory is that that's why the parental care period is so long. It's, it's 10 to 12 months for otters. And it seems like they, uh, they're fully grown and they're capable of catching fish, but it seems like the parental care period goes a little bit into the winter months. So they can learn a little bit from mom about, okay, it's a new game now with winter here, you know, in terms of their energy budget. So we, um, we have a couple of questions about the map um, and about their distribution. So I'll just give you three questions off the bat. Yeah. One is, um, well, first off, whether this map is public facing, whether it's available online or whether it's going to be. Um, there's also questions about um, how far west they go in both the north and the south. And um, there's an interesting question about whether there's any um, concern about illegal trappings if the map is publicly available. Okay. No, good question. So a lot of those questions can be answered by going on to the CTUP website and downloading my 2018 River Otter report. Uh, it does have a map in there that shows the distribution at that time. It's the furthest west I found them is in um, the, the Laddington area. So it's just east of Glen Cove. Um, we're working on a river herring uh, recovery project, restoration project that is gonna be on the Queens uh, Nassau County border. And we're keeping our fingers crossed that we can get uh, otters into that area. Uh, it's great habitat for them. 
but that's the furthest west we found, and that's on the North Shore. The furthest west we found established home ranges on the South Shore is the Connecticut River. And yes, trapping is um, is is a concern. Um, it's illegal to trap otters on Long Island, and uh, and I hope it stays that way. Um, but that's a battle that we may have in the future when the population is more robust than it is today. So there's, um, again, I'm gonna throw two questions at you so we're gonna, yeah. <laughs> there's so many, um, but there are people asking whether um, this, re th this reintroduction of otters was done by humans, maybe by DEC or whether they just migrated uh, here? No. Uh, they, they, uh, yeah, so they are naturally recolonizing Long Island. The reintroduction project was done in the western part of the state. Okay. And then there's also, um, this is interesting, um, somebody's asking whether there's something about the geography of the North Shore that lends itself to, you know, to be a better habitat for otters than the South Shore or, or, um, or whether that's true okay. or not. Yeah, no, so the reason why they got established on the North Shore first is because they're coming from uh, points of land that are closest to the North Shore. So, you know, the juveniles are dispersing from robust populations that were reestablished some decades ago in Connecticut and Westchester County. And although river otters are really great swimmers, they're predisposed not to make open water crossings of more than about five miles. We don't know why that is. Uh, it's possible that they're not able to discern a landmass more than five miles away, um, but we're not really sure. They're most successful hunting for fish in shallow water. So they might not want to, when they're dispersing, they might just take shallow water routes around to get away from uh, their natal home range. So they're coming in, if you look at a map and you say, okay, where's five miles or less from populations of river otters that are breeding and is well established. It's Pelham Bay Park over to around Sands Point, Kings, Kings Park area. And uh, it appears that Shoe Swamp is the first real good spot where they uh, set up a breeding population in Western. Now on the East End, uh, there's been a pair that were, were in the uh, South Hold area, the Greenport area back in 2008. Um, the female got hit by a car when I just started the study and she had uh, two fresh placental scars. So those young wouldn't have made it because uh, she wasn't around to nurse them. So represented three dead otters. It's possible the otters uh, that got established on in the South Hold area came from the population on Fisher's Island. Uh, so um, I, I did a survey there in 2012 and 2013 and um, I found more otter latrines on Fisher's Island than I found on all of Long Island in 2008. So they had a breeding population there and most of the juveniles that were born on Fisher's Island because it's so small, they're gonna have to take to the water and disperse. And some of them may have made the, the hop along uh, Great Gull Island, Plum Island. We did find tracks, otter tracks on Plum Island and then make it to Oregon. And I just okay. want to add that the map that I presented earlier, so it is a work in progress. It's kind of a draft version of what we have right now, but eventually it will be available online for people to use. Um, in addition to the Otter Watch survey link, that'll be posted online shortly as well. Okay, um, so it is six o'clock. Um, we could go on for maybe a, another a couple of couple more minutes, maybe five more minutes, um, but we do want to be respectful of people's times. Um, maybe two more questions. Does that sound okay? Yeah, sure. Um, so 
there are questions about um, the latrines and how many individuals are associated okay. with each latrine and how whether because there are overlaps in, in latrine areas, whether there are other types of research to identify populations, maybe genetics or, or something like that. Okay. Surprised that question's coming so far at the end. <laughs> that's, the, that's the question. We, we all always get, how many others are there? Or whatever we're studying, you know, how many spotted turtles are there? That's a tough question. Um, so the answer to that is the otters are very sociable animals. The males travel together in coastal areas where there's a rich fish resource. Um, in, in numbers, more than a dozen will travel together. Now, I haven't seen that on Long Island. I haven't seen evidence of that, but I do have photographs of four otters traveling together and um, they actually do cooperative hunting so they'll on the coast you have schooling fish um, and they'll they'll herd the school into shallow water work together and then uh, pick them off so yeah they're not territorial um, so they don't defend the little territory to the exclusion of other otters they they have home ranges that they get to know intimately and move around in those home ranges and they're very large, but other otters come and go in and out of those home ranges as well. They're, they're uh, overlapping home ranges. So when you go to an otter site and you see uh, 12 or 30 scats in little piles around the area, you, you have no idea how many otters there are. It could be one otter that's been there for uh, you know five days, and it could be it could be a group of four to six otters. It could be a family, a mother with depending on the year. Mother in the in the fall, the mother travels with the the two pups in in her home range. Um, so it could be the three of them. So the, the there was a mention of DNA. Yes, that's something I'm very interested in getting funding to do. Is to uh, take one watershed, map out the linear miles of shoreline, collect the scat over the course of one year, and, 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 and come up with a number of individuals from the DNA work from that scat. And then I could say, okay, the, the, a typical tidal uh, watershed on Long Island can, with, with X amount of linear uh, miles, of habitat can support X number of otters. And I can extrapolate that to other watersheds that have otters. It still is a little, it's, it's gonna, you know, it's, it's plus or minus a lot, but it would be an interesting thing to do. More interesting though with that idea is I would love to collect scat from Fisher's Island and be able to conclusively say that the South Hole population is more related to the Fisher Island population. That would be really interesting. And I would, there was a question about New York City. I, I tried to, um, to work with New York City parks and survey some of the places around there, like the Bronx River. I'm sure the Bronx River has an established otter population, just maybe a couple, but, uh, and then um, uh, Staten Island. Um, and I expect they'll eventually make it into Jamaica Bay. It's some great habitat, a lot of fish in Jamaica Bay. Uh, but I didn't, I didn't get the okay from them, but I haven't given up. Um, I'm still working on that. Okay, so I have a a, a burst of questions for you. Um, the, these are ecology questions and then also about your methodology. So people are asking what, how you take your pictures. Um, do you use drones for that one in East Hampton for the, the picture you showed in East Hampton? Um, and how do you use the, the pictures that you showed for the videos, I believe is what they're asking for. Um, uh, from the from the like lower in the trees yeah um yeah. and then for the ecology questions we have at what water depths would you uh, most expect to find otters do they den um what is the salinity range range um uh, for their uh, excuse me so sorry so salinity tolerance for right. their predation range um 
I think that's enough for that okay. burst. <laughs> okay, um, so uh, salinity, they're, they're fine in salt water. As I said, they spend a lot of time in the, in the estuary hunting um, blue crab. They love American eel. And, uh, and they'll, they, they, a lot of their diet is mummy chog and striped killifish in certain areas. Uh, now, the, there's a question, there's another unknown. Uh, do they have to rinse in fresh water in the colder months of the year um, so that they, that when they, then their fur dries, the salt crystals will impact their insulation value? Um, that has, not been conclusively proven for the North American river otter. It has for the Eurasian otter, but not, not for the North American river otter. So something for someone to figure out, someone out there in the uh, audience. Uh, in terms of the cameras, uh, uh, I use, I just use these, you know, uh, camera traps that you set up. Some of them are, can do video and photo, some just photo. I haven't used a drone, um, and um, and then a lot of the photos that you're going to be able to uh, pick out on the map, those are photos that people have sent me, and also some videos people have sent me. And that, so, okay, <laughs> I did notice a question. Wait a minute, you said they were nocturnal, and a lot of those photos were daylight. Yeah, that's why I use other people. I mean, it's... it's they're, they're, nothing's really strictly nocturnal. Um, you know, you can see deer out in the middle of the day sometimes. Um, so yeah, in, in, in the winter when they, they have to eat a lot, they have a high metabolism and the days are short, uh, you know, they, you might see them out uh, in the daytime. But generally, they do their big movements uh, at, at night. And, and it's, it's the same with coyote. We have pictures of, there's a picture right behind me of a coyote in a day. But they're mostly moving around at night. OK, thank you for that, Mike. So I think we'll do one more, and then we'll wrap it up. And I think this one's a good one to end on. So. Um, Oh, and one thing to note is you you will have um, access to this recording, like Ariel said, and you can you'll see the emails of our presenters today. So you can email Mike with your questions if you have more. Um, but the question for you, Mike, is big picture. What does it mean that they are recolonizing Long Island long term? What role do they play in an urban or heavily developed landscape? How how do you get people who aren't interested or are in opposition to wildlife? Um, to value their presence. So in short, why should we care? Okay, um, yeah, that's a good question. So um, there's been a lot of recent research that's turned the tables on uh, what we thought about top of the food chain carnivores. Um, and one of my colleagues that, that I've studied under in terms of like mammal track and sign, uh, Mark Elbrock, uh, he did a big study of, I think it was a, uh, over a decade of a study on mountain lions out west, and he found that um, mountain lions, uh, they're able to take down big ungulates, and they're not able to eat the whole ungulate carcass before other things move in. So he created this food web just based around mountain lion kills. It's unbelievable. Golden eagles, uh, all sorts of uh, small mammals, uh, grizzly bears and black bears, they all rely on this food source. It's incredible. Um, so, you know, where does the otter fit in? Well, you know, part of it is an unknown. We don't really know that, that the answer to that question. But generally, ecosystems function well when you have all the parts. You know, you could take a part out of your car engine that maybe uh, doesn't make that much of a difference in how it runs, but generally things run best when you have all the parts. And um, the question actually assumes that we know a lot more than we do know. 
and the problem there, I always feel is like when, when you're studying something or you're listening to someone give a lecture, they tell you what they know. And they don't tell you what they don't know. The lecture's about, this is what we know. And you come away assuming that we know everything. Now there's so much we don't know. And I, want, I will add one other thing to the idea of, um, I, have, I have run into, fortunately not too many people, but a few people that got really worked up about the fact that otters eat fish and they like to fish, the people like to fish. And they um, challenged me on the notion that otters on Long Island were gonna decimate the brook trout population, which we did a number on already, but we're trying to bring it back. And I said to them, if you wanted to go fishing in New York state, if you wanted to go fishing for brook trout, where would you go? He thought about it for like 10 seconds and said, I'd go, I'd go to the Adirondacks. Yeah, well, guess where otters were never extirpated from New York State? Never in the Adirondacks. So if you wanna say something about otters and brook trout, <laughs> the only thing you could say, and I know it's illogical, but the only thing you could really say is where there are otters, there are brook trout, you know? <laughs> um, so the point being that otters don't go after um, they, they, they tend to go after the fish that are most numerous and most easy to catch. And it's rare, well, have they ever taken a brook trout? Absolutely, but they're not responsible for the demise of any brook trout in any area in North America. Awesome, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mike, for answering all those questions. I know we might have not gotten to every single question, um, but like I said earlier, we will provide our contact information so you can email us with any lingering questions that you might have had. Um, I just want to go ahead and thank the panelists here today. Jimena, thank you so much for manning the Q&A section. Mike, you know, thank you for your presentation and answering those questions. And thank you to everyone who took time out of their evening tonight and shared it with us to learn about river otters on Long Island. Um, so we're super grateful to have had you here. I know I had a great time. We hope you also did as well. And there will be a follow-up email with all the resources. We'll let you know when this webinar is online. We'll include that survey link um, and any other useful information that we might have gone over today will be included in that um, follow-up email. So again, thank you so much. We hope to see you next month for the second installment of Community Science LI, where we will be exploring river herring monitoring on Long Island. So we hope to see you there. Stay safe and enjoy the rest of the night. <laughs>